back, everyone. We have a distinguished panel to start the, the conference. Uh, people I, 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 we all know, uh, one way or another, probably read a lot of their stuff. Um, they've been in the field, environmental and climate security related issues for a long time. Have all sorts of experience and have asked them to tell us basically where climate security has been, is currently, and will be, or should be going into the future. So it's very, my pleasure to introduce them in the order they will be presenting. Uh, I'll go very quickly, if you don't mind, just so that I don't, uh, you know, uh, take too much time presenting them. We'll start with the Honorable Sharon Burke, who is uh, president of e Ecospherics, a research and consulting film focused on the secure implication of climate change, energy, biodiversity loss, critical minerals and agriculture. You see, she's also co-founder of the Eco Security Council. She has worked with the uh, Biden Iris transition team. She served at the State Department in the George W. Bush administration and as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy in the Obama administration. So she's a frequent, a frequent uh, uh, public speaker, published writer, and strategic advisor, corporate boards, national labor laboratories, pardon me, and U.S. government agencies. Um, then we'll go with uh, Simon Dalby who is Professor Emeritus at Wilfrid Laurier University, a fellow at the Bell Seeley School of International Affairs, senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, CG, and a senior research fellow at the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria. And as a retired professor, he's only been writing like three books in like two years or something like that. So <laughs> welcome to Simon. Uh, then we'll... On my left here, Colin Hendricks, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, non-resident senior research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security, and fellow at the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines. He has been affiliated with PIIE since 2010. His 30 plus peer review articles in relationship between the international markets, natural resources, and conflict, as well as the economic security applications of climate change have appeared in various journals like Nature, Nature, Climate Change, and so on and so forth. He has also been a contributing author to the 2022 IPCC report. Then we have Professor Marcus Dubois King, who is Professor of Practice in the Environment in Environment International Affairs at Georgetown University, Enmin Walsh School of Foreign Service. He is Vice Chairman of the Council of Strate on Strategic Risks and Senior Fellow at the Center for Climate and Security. He is also working as um, a Pardon me, his experience includes uh, CNA's Corporation Center for Analysis, as well as position in U.S. Departments of Energy and Defense. His most recent books is Weaponizing Water, Water, sorry, Weaponizing Water, Water, Stress, and Islamic Violence in Africa and Middle East, published in 2023 at Line Reiner. And we also have Dr. Kitty Woodward, who is Deputy uh, Head of Research Analysis and Lessons at NATO's Climate Change and Security Center of Excellence in Montreal, specializing in the fields of so psychology, human security, terrorism, and social and behavioral impacts of climate change. Dr. Woodward represents the UK Ministry of Defense in developing evidence, spends insights to assess, anticipate, act, and adapt in multifaceted challenges posed by climate change. So thank you everyone for being here. Very happy. Looking forward to hear all from you. I'm going to ask you to speak for about 12 minutes so that we try to save 30 minutes for a conversation at the end. Sharon? Okay. Thank you, Bruno, and thank you for gathering us all here. Uh, it was so interesting listening to the to your director this morning, and you know, I'm uh, Marcus and I were discussing. I'm used to being the only person in a room full of people that works on climate security, so it's very uh, it's it's disorienting in a good way to be in a room full of people who work on this. And um, I, and I will, as I talk about where we've been, where we are, where we're going as far as the U.S. government is concerned, I will try to keep that in mind that we don't need to go back to basics with this particular crowd. Um, and I, I will be talking about the U.S. government partially because that's been a lot of my career, as you heard, and, and also because a lot of the early work on this concept came out of the United States, and that is largely, I think, a factor uh, of the importance of the military uh, 
institutionally and intellectually, and I'll come back to that. Um, it's kind of intriguing to think that this became a defense and military issue, climate security did, when the military really doesn't have the most important role in these issues, um, not when it comes to climate action. They don't, they never will, well, not never. Um, innovation, economic development, infrastructure improvements, changes in societal patterns, even the way that climate impacts peace and stability, it's not something you can defeat with weapons platforms and the military doesn't really have the right tools um, unless we're talking about a very worst case scenario, um, which I will not talk about today. So it's fascinating to think, so how did, at least in the United States, the Department of Defense become so important in the development of this concept? And I'm gonna walk you through the history as someone who was there, who's been there, and be a little dishy about it. So, um, so I know you said it's Chatham House rules, but since we're streaming, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> <You're doing best. laughs> so for a long time, the dialogue on this was really two different things going on. First of all, in the United States, for a, for a while there, we were nearly obsessed with energy security, which was understandable. Um, we were import dependent and increasingly so every year, and prices were rising at the same time. Um, there were you know, serial global market disruptions, price disruptions over and over again that did great damage to the U.S. and global economy. Um, but climate change was largely, when it was considered, was considered separately as a separate issue. And of course, that won't work if you consider them separately because then you're solving linked problems um, in isolation, uh, which will come back to bite you for sure. So at the same time, um, uh, oh, well, I was gonna give an example of that. It, so, for example, in the George W. Bush administration, when oil prices hit an all-time high, it was not lost on anyone that within the U.S. government, the largest user of, of energy by far, uh, more than 80 percent, is the U.S. Armed Forces, and that you could use that as leverage and a catalyst. And so the U.S. Air Force actually tried to build coal-to-liquid refineries um, during that administration. It did not come to a happy ending. We can talk more about that, too, if you want to can find me on the side. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, Obama administration, when we came in, walked the same ground except with biofuels and found that even though the U.S. Armed Forces use a lot of fuel relative to the global market, it's not enough to, to change a market. Um, so both of those efforts were problematic. So, um, well, on a separate track, even as there was so much work going on on energy security, and I think Marcus will talk more about this, so I won't say too much, but environmental security as a practice at the Pentagon started in the, in the 80s really in earnest. It was really a post-Cold War artifact and had to do with the cleanup of the Cold War. And uh, not only did, did that result in professional practice that Marcus was really important to founding in the early days, um, it, it also introduced a culture of stewardship. So you'll still hear, for example, the Marine Corps talk about their domestic bases as a, a matter of stewardship. So those things were happening in parallel. Neither one was necessarily looking at climate change, but certainly laying the groundwork for how we do. Now, the first time you see the Department of Defense, uh, you know, climate change would pop up here and there, um, but the first time you see a dedicated research product that looks at it was in about 2003, yeah, 2003, and this was called An Abrupt Climate Change Scenario and Its Implications for United States National Security. Um, and it was a collapse of the, of the AMOC, of the Atlantic Current scenario, basically, 2003. Um, the reason that this doesn't count <laughs> is that it was commissioned by an office called the Office of Net Assessment in the Office of the Secretary of Defense which is a really, really interesting, um, uh, very odd office in the Pentagon. It's like an internal think tank whose mission is to do out of the box thinking, to challenge conventional wisdom and particularly to be forward looking. Um, but they're very private, like they, they're very secretive almost and they don't always share the work and this study quickly disappeared. But it was commissioned to say sort of what if you know, what, what, how could this potentially affect security? So um, it, it didn't necessarily get much out of the offices of net assessment with one exception, really interesting. 
which is apparently the authors of it. The author, one of the authors told me this, so I, I have no idea if it's true or not, but one of the authors said that um, they worked on the, the 2004 film um, The Day After Tomorrow with Dennis Quaid, so that their study informed that movie. If you've never seen that movie or if it's been a while, you might want to go back and watch it with all the recent news about the Atlantic Current. Um, it's not accurate. I see a, someone, presumably a scientist, going, no, don't, don't watch it. <laughs> um, but interesting that these guys informed this, this, uh, this uh, very extreme what-if case. Uh, so around 2007, all of a sudden, the, every, the climate change, climate security explodes. So why? Uh, first of all, it was a lot of non-governmental activism. Sherry Goodman, who Marcus has worked with a lot, at uh, the Center for Naval Analysis um, put together and paneled a group of retired, it's really important that you be clear, this was not a US government study, of retired admirals and generals who talked about the national security implications of climate change around the same time. Kirk Campbell, who is now the Deputy Secretary of State in the US, uh, put out an Age of Consequences report that looked at also climate security, very passionate about the topic, which should be interesting for his tenure at state. Um, and also Josh Busby at the Council on Foreign Relations put out a study also on the national security implications of climate change, all in 2007. Um, and this, I think, is, uh, there was also, of course, in the UN Security Council, a debate uh, that the UK put forward around the same time. So all of a sudden we have this going. Um, why, why focus on the Department of Defense? It reflects the predominance of DOD in governance. Now, it's always worth pointing out that when you look at the U.S. national budget, the majority of it goes to social programs. So Medicare, Medicaid, um, Social Security, not to defense. A lot of people will say, oh, it's the biggest part of the national budget. Not even close. So, but of the part of the budget that's discretionary, that's liquid, DOD is a large part. About a trillion dollars a year all in when you count nuclear weapons and veterans. So DOD is, is really predominant in U.S. governance. Um, more than 80 percent, as I said, of federal energy use is at the Department of Defense, which also manages about 28 million acres of land worldwide. It is a major employer across the United States, including in California and Texas, the biggest states. So DOD has a very important uh, public policy role. Also, there's bipartisan confidence both at a popular level and at a, in the political circles in the armed forces in the United States. It wasn't always that way, of course. This is largely a factor of the all-volunteer force starting in 1973 and the professionalization of the military. Um, public opinion on the military was very low at that time, but has been up in the 80%. Right now it's falling. 69% um, three years ago, 60% now public confidence in the military. However, you put that into confidence, it, into context, um, the American public has lost confidence in institutions, generally speaking, and only the military and small business, which I would argue is not even an institution, it's a concept, <laughs> um, are above 50% confidence. So the military enjoys uh, that, and then that translates also into political salience. So some of this activism was to triangulate and to try to bring a place where the two political parties could come together on climate change. And it worked. So, um, okay, so rushing through that, um, there was a, a national intelligence assessment in 2008. In 2010, the Quadrennial Defense Review, which no longer happens, but was a, every four years, well, roughly, um, strategy document mentioned climate change. Okay, uh, things kind of died a little bit in the Bush administration, came back in the Obama, especially second term, didn't want to run on it. Um, but lots, and then in Trump, of course, things died down again. Um, there were some things that happened, such as the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, which is a, a looks at physical asset risk <laughs> for the Department of Defense. That happened in the Trump administration. So where are we today? Step change. Uh, the Biden administration has put a tremendous amount of money, um, more than $2 trillion into play in infrastructure, clean energy, um, CHIPS Act, other things, related things. Um, important focus at DOD, too. Um, I would divide it into two. This has always been the case at, it, in the U.S. Department of Defense. 
there's a lot of activity focused on installations, military installations, and using them as a catalyst. So carbon-free electricity, electrification of non-tactical vehicles, microgrids tied to the grid, those have all been um, big points of emphasis. A lot of money has gone in there. Um, what the area, other area that to me is, is really significant because those things are discretionary. They come and go, right? But how do you get into the system and change the institution from the ground up is you have to get into strategy development, requirements generation, what we would call, the acronym is awful, but JSIDs, the process by which you develop strategy plans, campaigns, weapons platforms, all of that. And this administration has done that. Um, it's, we've seen a lot of progress in research development, test and evaluation investments in uh, requirements definition with the energy key performance parameter, with energy supportability analysis for campaigns, it's required. Um, and there was also uh, in 2021 uh, a requirement to develop risk um, risk analysis for climate change. One thing that, that I think is one of the most helpful things it spurred on was a set aside in the Wargaming Incentive Fund that's managed by the joint staff for wargaming on climate change. So now we've seen a, a whole wealth of gaming. And again, that as an analytical tool at the Department of Defense is really important. It feeds all of the processes. All of the combatant commands, the regional combatant commands have now done at least one climate game. Uh, a number of the, the military departments have as well. That's how we actually get change is to get into the institutional um, um, workings. Last word. I mean, obviously, everybody here is aware that next year we're looking at a strongly divergent path. Um, if Donald Trump is elected, uh, this time, a lot of time things went to ground and work continued to happen. You know, just because something's politically contentious, the military doesn't stop working on it. We work on Iran, and that's politically contentious. But I think this time you're going to see things really. Um, destroyed. There's going to be, they're going to root out some of this work and they're not going to fill jobs or they're going to eliminate jobs. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of loss of capacity in this area. If Biden is elected, re-elected, there will be an unprecedented amount of activity in this space. And a lot of things have been teed up over the last three years that haven't quite delivered yet. So there aren't actually a lot of electric vehicles at bases yet but all the work has been done. So it's a key moment on this issue and which way it goes, uh, either way is hard to say. Um, finally, increasingly, I think we need to be clear that the way we define security traditionally, um, you know, it's difficult to say this at a time with two very dangerous wars going on that affect all of our interests and engage us directly, but the way that we define security as something about the force of arms is clearly too narrow and we're seeing an acceleration of all of these trends and the way that they come together from you know water de water energy resource sufficiency more broadly climate change biodiversity loss plastics pollution this is all going to define security in the basic sense in the most meaningful sense and probably increasingly as a as an accelerant for instability and we are not as government set up for that we aren't set we don't have the right governance tools we don't have the right analysis and the real gap there the last thing i'll say is that where the biggest analytical gap is to me having worked on this in government and think tanks for a long time is in is what's actionable there's good intellectual work and there's good practitioner work but there's a gap there between the two and feeding what you can actually put into a process from the intellectual infrastructure. There's just not enough of that kind of work. And I know we'll talk more about that over the course of this conference, which I think is a really important step forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. <laughs> Simon. 12 minutes the man asked for. OK, here goes. It went by fast. Um, yeah, it does go by fast, doesn't it? Uh, nearly as fast as that awful movie from 2004. <laughs> um, it 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 really is it really is dreadful. Although I forgive it because of that wonderful scene in the middle where they link 
Scotch whiskey and Manchester United Football Club, and so it, you can for, you can forgive many things in a, in a movie that that is that awful. It's hilarious. It's so funny. It's, 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 it's so bad. It's funny. Please watch it if you haven't seen it. Um, Joking apart, uh, the, one of the crucial themes in that um, abrupt climate change report from 2003 that I found hugely depressing was the scenario on ravels and the assumption is in a crisis the reaction will be war, not trade. Um, uh, it will be conflict, not cooperation. And it really raises the question about what do we mean by security? Because clearly um, security has failed if you end up in a situation of conflict where the possibility of cooperation has been foreclosed by policy options that have not considered it as a method of, of uh, common security, global security, or as I want to talk about in a minute, planetary security. Um, and I think that the, one of the things that was very depressing about that was the presupposition that in a crisis, um, conflict is the result, rather than an opportunity to think seriously about institution building and cooperation, which is at the heart of what I would argue climate security has ultimately to be about if we are to take it seriously. Um, I have paper uh, available if anybody wants it, G Simon or sdalby at gmail.com, and I'll try and get it to you. Uh, I didn't intend to write this paper. I didn't intend to write the paper for tomorrow's panel either, but in trying to sort out my thinking uh, for my talking points, the paragraph started to grow, and eventually I realized I was writing a paper, and then Bruno says, can you be on two panels? And I split it in half, so now I've got two papers. Um, you're, and, and basically, um, uh, this one is, is, is context, um, tomorrow's is policy, um, and that's really what I'm, I want to talk about briefly today is, is the context. Um, uh, starting with Catherine Hayhoe, um, uh, probably the highest profile Canadian climate scientist who happens to be teaching in Texas these days, amongst other things, her line about we have built a civilization for a planet that no longer exists. We have built a civilization for a planet that no longer exists. It seems to me to summarize um, much of the larger contextual issue of which climate change is a part. Um, and yes, to um, Sharon's point, um, there's a lot of other important issues happening simultaneously, and we would do well um, to bear in mind that climate is simply one part of what is increasingly these days called a polycrisis. Um, which is economics, uh, the failure of institutions to grapple with the interconnectedness of uh, many phenomena that are causing difficulties around the world. A word, polycrisis, may not be the best word. It's the currently trendy word, so I'm using it here. In thinking back through the um, discussion about climate and security for um, my... <laughs> 30-something or other years working on this topic. The academic um, uh, uh, discussion is somewhat different from the, from the policy discussion um, because we really started talking about this stuff in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and gradually, as the debate has um, <coughs> flowed through the last three and a half decades, climate has become more and more obviously the, the focus of it. The larger environmental discussions about resources, um, biodiversity, and, and numerous other things um, has tended to get squared squeezed out of the discussion by the ever-increasing prominence of climate. But nonetheless, we have been talking about these as academics now since the, since the late 80s. My concern about how we think about uh, this whole discussion um, is clearly if you juxtapose climate and security and you start with security, um, you end up focusing on the climate impacts on national security. And much of the li literature, um, particularly the last decade, has done just that. Um, Josh Busby's already been mentioned. His big book um, now two years ago um, was a very interesting comparison of a bunch of different case studies. Gabrielle is back here somewhere or other um, with Jan Selby and Clemens Hoffman's um, book on, on, um, on water and particularly on Africa has teased out the practicalities of a lot of this and also raised some red flags about how we contextualize this stuff. But what happens if you actually start with climate, not with security? Because if you look at the climate literature and the climate science literature, um, and then think about that as the starting point, and then go, well, how do you deal with that in security terms? You may end up in a very different place than if you start with national security and the impacts of climate on it. 
um, one could make the argument, which is implicit in what Sharon was talking about a minute ago, that uh, the huge use of carbon fuels by military establishment is actually part of what is making climate worse. And it's not difficult to, to make that argument, which is, of course, why if we can manage to reduce the number of wars happening on planet Earth, um, it helps for climate um, because the sheer amount of fuel used, particularly in expeditionary forces and supply systems around the world, uh, is huge. Um, and it would certainly help, um, but that's still a relatively small percentage of the total carbon budget. If you start with the science, the first and most obvious thing that needs to be talked about is the urgency of grappling with climate change. Um, it isn't something for the future, it is happening now, um, um, and we are seeing all sorts of disruptions already kicking in, uh, which are making agriculture and infrastructure um, suffer. Um, we are seeing strange phenomena like those um, uh, livestock killing winters um, hitting Mongolia far more often now than they used to. Um, we are seeing storms do things that we, the forecasters never anticipated. Uh, the destruction of Acapulco um, last fall happened at least in part because the uh, storm um, uh, became much more severe much more quickly than anybody had ever seen um, a hurricane do before and consequently the forecasting was off simply because the sheer severity of the storm took everybody by surprise because it had um, uh, become much more severe so much more quickly. Um, all sorts of things like this are causing human security in Bosch, Josh Busby's terms um, uh, disasters, but they're already happening. How are we to think about this um, in terms of the, uh, wh what we need to think about in terms of security? Clearly we're in novel circumstances. Um, historical parallels may be a very bad um, indication of what's going on simply because of the novelty of these circumstances. Um, it's important, I think, to think about this at the big scale, and of course, being a security thinker, I inevitably go and ask, well, what's Barry Buzan got to say about it, uh, Mr. Big, in terms of security thinking in, in Britain? Um, and his emphasis is to um, focus on the fact that we are living in extraordinary times. There's nothing normal about the circumstances we are now in. Modernity, he argues, in the larger historical context, needs to be understand, understood as a transition moment to, well, what's coming. Um, and that's, of course, the crux of the issue, because decisions made by um, investment companies, as well as defense planners, now are shaping that future. Um, and the transition moment uh, in captured by the Earth system scientists in terms of the Anthropocene notion um, of new novel circumstances in the Earth system um, means that humanity, the rich, powerful, industrial, um, and, and investment parts of humanity are deciding the future conditions for the rest of humanity in perpetuity. Um, understanding ourselves as in that transition moment rather than in, as an, in a normal state where we have to try to stabilize um, turns um, the conventional understandings of security as protecting what we have into something where we've got to consider what we are making um, in terms of the future. And this requires a fundamental um, shift. It challenges um, all sorts of modes of thinking. Uh, heading in my paper is simply all at sea question mark because over the last 18 months or so one of the things that is quite extraordinary is the uh, um, anomalously high surface temperatures of the oceans. We think about climate in terms of its terrestrial impacts but the earth system is driven far more by what is happening in the oceans than it is by what is happening on land. If 80 or 90 percent of the carbon and 80 or 90 percent, depending on the figures, of the heat that which we are adding to the system is going into the oceans, um, we only think about it in terms of its terrestrial con uh, consequences. But again, thinking about what is happening to oceans um, is absolutely crucial because we are focusing on um, we are focusing on the Earth system as what needs to be needs to be done. Um, three minutes. Okay. Um, much of the uh, literature uh, in, that is relevant here um, is pointing not only are we maybe looking in the wrong places, um, but we're also looking with all sorts of instrumental 
um, focuses on things. We're looking at institutional blinders on in many cases, and boy, is that ever the case in the academics that do this stuff. Um, trying to get across the disciplines can be really hard. I've spent my career trying to do it, and every now and again it works, and a lot of the time people look at me as though I'm completely nuts. Um, but it does suggest that we need to think in transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, terms with a sense that we need to think about the planet and planetarity, as it is now increasingly called. Um, find yourself a, a, little, a little book that's just appeared um, called Children of a Modest Star uh, by Gilman and Blake, um, trying to figure out how it is that we embed our discussions of social institutions in the changing planetary context, because that really is what needs to be thought about. And of course, in academic terms, it requires putting the social sciences, the Earth Systems folks, together, um, which many of us have been trying to do. Um, but that requires us to think somewhat differently. In terms of urgency, um, I think that we need to stop and think very hard about the derailment risks. Um, if we don't do it, what f uh, possible futures are being foreclosed? Um, we will derail climate change um, action uh, if we simply don't get on it quickly enough. It will simply foreclose future possibilities, not least um, because the resources that uh, may be uh, available will be uh, devoted to dealing with immediate disasters rather than long-term transition strategies. Uh, and I think that this is absolutely crucial. The role of the security sector needs to be rethought too because clearly it has an alarm and warning um, uh, function in societies, doesn't it? Nick maybe 17 years ago wrote a paper for RUSI, the big think tank, the defense think tank in, in Britain, basically saying that the institution that has the responsibility to warn of existential risks is surely the security sector um, and raising the alarm would seem to be something that will also um, be continuing function uh, in terms of how we link climate and security together. Finally, uh, just to wrap up, um, uh, I would just remind Mathieu, um, uh, in terms of, of the role of CASCO, um, one of the best reports written on environment and security in uh, mere 25 years ago um, came out of NATO in terms of its committee on the, on the problems of modern societies. Um, they did a big synthesis report in 1999 on environment and security, which was actually rather good in terms of putting together the whole discussion of that from the academic and, and research sources in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the 1990s. Uh, and w it would be very helpful, it seems to me, um, if the NATO Center of Excellence uh, could think seriously about the warning function, the alarm raising function, um, getting the dangers of not dealing with climate change um, seriously into uh, national deliberations in, in many countries. Um, not least in Canada, where the complete and utter incoherence of carbon taxes simultaneously with $18 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry last year suggests policy incoherence on a grand scale. Um, uh, and that too, of course, has to be uh, something that serious security thinkers think about. Um, the failure of uh, joining up the dots um, is spectacular, particularly in this country, and I think it's a kind of a problem in a few other places too. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> oh. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here we, with you this afternoon, or sorry, this morning still. We're still in the morning, excuse me. I'd like to thank both uh, the, the Francope Center and uh, the Climate Security Association of Canada for having us. Um, I think my slides are on their way up. Um, and, and for bringing uh, all of us into the path of totality, which is <laughs> a pretty cool way of saying we're going to have a really nice and memorable coffee break this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much for putting up the slides. Over the last few years, I've had a couple of opportunities to take stock of the, the field of climate security, uh, one under the auspices of the National Intelligence Council's Global Trends Report, uh, released in 2021, and then later as part of the IPCC process. So what I'm going to be offering today is my perspective on the evolution of this field or the state of the state of the art, focusing on four areas of what I, I think are, are relatively recent and significant achievements. The first is a better understanding of how political, social, and economic context matters for understanding when and where 
Climate-related factors and natural disasters lead to hard security challenges, to say nothing of the grave threats they create for human security. The second would be a move beyond looking only, or at least mostly, at civil wars in developing regions, the focus of the field for many years, to looking at other types of security outcomes, ranging from interstate conflict uh, to protest and rioting, and looking directly at the hard security impacts for middle income and even advanced economies. That's something I think that's relatively new. Uh, the third is a better understanding of mechanisms or the pathways via which changes in the environment lead to conflict behavior. And finally, a shift to thinking about second order effects of climate change or thinking about the security consequences of the things human communities are doing to either adapt to or mitigate climate change. I'll, I'll, I'll seek to illustrate these changes by mentioning a few studies and scholars, but in doing so, of course, I will only be able to skim the surface, uh, so no offense intended to anyone whose name doesn't get mentioned. Um, but at the end, I hope you'll agree that much progress has been made. Uh, so as Simon alluded to earlier, scholarly interest in climate security has exploded in the 21st century. I entered graduate school in the fall of 2000, which was almost one year exactly to the date before world events would make terrorism and civil war the hot security issues of the day. I chose to write my dissertation on environmental security issues, and I can recall very clearly a member of my committee telling me that I was making a very bad choice and wasting my time in studying such a fringe topic. Now, in making the choice to study climate security, uh, I was not prescient, I, I was simply lucky, right place, right time. Uh, but climate security as a topic of scholarly interest has become a lot less fringe. Uh, this chart plots kind of the meteoric rise of climate security as a topic of scholarly interest using data from Google Scholar. Interest in terrorism is greater overall, I should say, during this period, but it stayed relatively flat for the last two decades, uh, actually falling in this most recent period analyzed. Meanwhile, interest in climate security has increased by about 3,000 percent. That's a nice delta uh, basically anywhere you're from. Now, with, in with increasing scholarly interest has come a deepening of our understandings of climate impacts on hard security outcomes, especially conflict outcomes. Now, the chart on the left was produced by Colin Call, who's better known to most of you as a senior Department of Defense official and President Biden's national security advisor during Biden's time as vice president. It reflects the state of the art circa 1998 in terms of a conceptual model of when and how demographic and environmental stress rising or shifting populations, increasing depletion of renewable resources, and an equitable distribution of those resources and sources of resilience across social groups, depicted here is that black uh, box, or I guess I should say black circle that's over on the left, if you can see that, would lead to conflict. And don't worry, the fact that you can't read any of that is orthogonal to the point. Now, in 2023, uh, Halvard uh, uh, Buhag, uh, Elizabeth Gilmore, Tour Benjaminson, and I published this chart in Climate Risk Management, which basically unpacks that black box and fleshes out some of the specific mechanisms linking climate change hazards and responses to risk to peace. IPCC speak for conflict and significant loss of life. Now, I, I say some of the mechanisms because as we pointed out in the accompanying caption, this chart is deliberately parsimonious and does not feature important non-climatic factors that independently affect risk to peace, feedback effects from the breakdown of peace, or social contexts that make these pathways more or less likely to materialize. Now, when your deliberately parsimonious model has become this complex, you know that the field has widened considerably. All right, so what are the key advances? I'll start with understanding context. Uh, thanks to work by people like Nina von Uxkul, uh, and also Josh Busby, who you heard about earlier, we have a better understanding of some of the contextual factors that help explain why a climate-related shock, like a drought or a cyclonic storm or flooding, would lead to violence in one context but not in another. Now, if you accept the premise that drought was a key driver of the Syrian civil war, you still need to explain why the dr that drought led to such disastrous outcomes in Syria, but the same drought, meteorologically speaking, the same drought, did not have the same effects for Jordan or Lebanon which were also hit very hard, but didn't just weather the storm, but were also able to shoulder an incredible and I think underappreciated humanitarian burden created by Syria's refugee crisis. I think Dr. Busby's recent book, States in Nature, presents a very useful and actually parsimonious, unlike our conceptual diagram from hell, 
model to explain climate security outcomes. Busby identifies three important factors, political inclusion, or whether different groups within society have access to social safety nets and representation in government decision making, state capacity, or whether the government can effectively implement its policy goals, and finally, the role of international assistance or whether the international community can help or is even permitted to do so. So I think that this model actually helps us to understand the Syrian case. Syria was, in retrospect, a prime case for climate-sparked conflict because Syria was and remains a highly exclusionary, a highly exclusionary excuse me, weakly legitimate state governed by a, governing a majority rural, agriculturally dependent society, dominated by a small ethno-religious minority, and in which other ethnic and religious groups were and are subject to state-sanctioned persecution, and were harmed, not helped, by government policies during the drought. Drought may have been the spark, but there was plenty of tinder there. A uh, second big shift has been away from focusing narrowly on civil wars like Syria and thinking about the effects of climate-related uh, factors for other security outcomes, including those that don't just arise in developing country contexts, but also those that affect major powers and economies. In the interest of brevity, I'll just highlight a study I conducted with a team led by my wife, Sarah Glasser, at the World Wildlife Fund. We analyzed 60 years of data on militarized fishing disputes that involved at least one government's armed forces or Coast Guard. So these were military, uh, military engagements. This is the military, militarized interstate dispute data set for the data nerds out there. We focused specifically on impacts for the East and South China Seas, one of the most heavily fished regions of the world and perhaps one of the most contested ocean regions on the planet. In that study, we linked patterns of fisheries disputes to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the most significant driver of year-to-year -year variability in global climate and found that these types of disputes were about three times as frequent during El Niños as they were during La Nina or kind of uh, ENSO neutral conditions. And that the relationship between El Nino and the onset of these disputes is strengthening over time. And these disputes are more frequently also involving China or Chinese vessels. Now that's just one example. We now also have a better understanding of how climate change is affecting a host of other outcomes, ranging from dynastic competition in early modern China, not sure about the policy relevance of that for our present discussion, but who knows, to how abnormally hot temperatures increased attacks on coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Put differently, climate security used to be conceived of largely as an issue for developing countries, with NATO countries mostly worried about the issues like sea level rise or wildfires on bases. Now, we know that climate and climate change are shaping the kinetic activities and operational environments of the most powerful countries on Earth. That brings me to a third development, a better though still incomplete understanding of the specific mechanisms by which climate extremes might lead to violence. One study uh, by Andrew Shaver and Alex Bolfress linked higher temperatures to increased likelihood of impulsive attacks against coalition troops in, Af in Iraq and Afghanistan, such as shootings, but not to premeditated attacks like IEDs. This was a genius decision on their part. They said, what are the kinds of attacks or the kinds of engagements that can be initiated by an individual acting impulsively as a response to environmental conditions versus where are the ones where we need to do a lot of advanced planning? And they found a strong temperature signal with respect to uh, these incidents that were begun uh, by, by you know, uh, an insurgent taking a couple of shots at coalition forces, and then separately analyzing the IEDs and found that there was no such relationship there. Um, now, in doing so, they found, they, they sort of presented evidence that's consistent with a physiological mechanism actually linking hotter temperatures with more political violence, uh, which is also consistent with some of the literature that we have coming out of criminology about the relationship between temperature and violent crime uh, in U.S. cities, also in European cities. Um, but then also the increasingly frequent ba uh, bean balls, so intentionally hit batsmen in Major League Baseball on unseasonably hot days, pulling together a lot of information from different types of studies. Um, Nina and her team also looked at exposure to climate disasters in the DRC and found that exposure to disasters increased survey respondents' level of support for political violence as a legitimate tool for addressing societal grievances. But they also found that interventions in the form of access to social services disrupted this relationship. Without understanding these mechanisms, we cannot hope to craft useful interventions. So I view these as being very useful uh, and important developments. Uh, the, finally, the fourth has been uh, a shift from thinking about what climate change is doing to us, 
to thinking about what we are doing to ourselves as we, adempt, uh, as, as we attempt to adapt to it and mitigate climate change. It would be wonderful, or excuse me, it is wonderful that the world's largest economies are getting more serious, maybe not entirely serious, but more serious about decarbonization and green energy. It is also wonderful that we're starting to better understand migration as a source of resilience uh, to climate change, rather than a cause of climate-related conflict. But it's important to keep in mind that in doing so, something about climate change, it will require us to change, and that change is unlikely to be anodyne or smooth. We live in a world of competing risks, and successful adaptation and mitigation will create a variety of economic and security challenges in their own right, which I think we'll be discussing at length this afternoon. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, like Sharon, my um, climate security perspective draws from Defense Department in the 90s, also working as a think tank analyst and also as a now a practitioner academic in environmental security. So my remarks on where the field is, um, where it should be going, are informed by the perspective of organizations that are really diverse, but hopefully can be complementary moving forward toward climate security objectives. So my bottom line is that I see the evolution of the broad climate security field in three stages. The first has been establishing the foundational concepts. Secondly, building and broadening the community of practice is what we're doing today. And then in the future, designing the educational framework that's needed for future analysis. So establishing a public and policy discourse on climate security um, was initially promoted by national security analysts primarily in the United States, but then later in Europe. So as was mentioned in 2007, the CNA, Center for Naval Analyses, produced their first report on national security and the threat of climate change. And this report established the concept of climate change has the potential to aggravate existing societal imbalances, social cleavages, um, and create new ones, serving as a threat multiplier. So um, again, as Sharon outlined back in 2007, 2009, this was the time of the advent of what I would call C-level organizations. So we had the Center for, um, for um, Climate and Security. We had the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We had the Center for New American Security um, at that time working on um, natural security. But the um, CNA report was clear language that socialized the concept that's now been the subject of needed expansion and scrutiny by scholars um, such as those here today. Um, but it was understandable and it resonated both with policy professionals in the United States, but also wider audiences. Um, and as been noted, the military remains one of the most trusted institutions um, in the US and that the climate security messages were able to transcend political bias in a way that hadn't be, been seen before at that time. So also at that time, um, Sherry Goodman, who was the former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense at the um, Pentagon, um, is publishing a book that also traces the threat multiplier um, concept and how it's evolved in the field um, stemming from this concept. And again, that the report mainstreamed the very understanding of climate security into the policy discourse, but it served as a concept to build upon for further research and inquiry. But second, I mentioned the building a community of practice, which is sort of where we are today. So a few years later in DC, a community of practice, also what I call an epistemic community, began to coalesce around climate security. So building on this community of practice was the next phase of what I would call the early climate and security project in DC. So in 2013, um, we formed a climate and security working group that was a joint project between the Center for Climate and Security and George Washington University, where I was on faculty at the time. And we met under the Chatham House rule, and it was composed of members of cabinet agencies, cognizant military agencies, think tanks, and academics with some um, social sciences, essentially, um, but very policy relevant research agendas. So the community promoted the further socialization of policy issues surfaced by the um, threat multiplier climate security framing. So the pr 
po purpose of these meetings over the next decade was twofold. First, it was to share information across disparate parts of the climate security community, but also to engage in collaborative agenda setting. So this organization served as a brain trust that could provide continuity in the face of political vagaries created by changes in presidential administrations um, and provide useful, useful foundational knowledge um, as new administrations emerged. So we also began to collaborate w more widely um, with initiatives like the Planetary Security Initiative in the Netherlands um, and other countries that placed climate change at a much higher place on their security agendas at the time than, than the U.S. Um, and we released a report through the Climate Security Working Group called Responsibility to Prepare, Strengthening National Homeland Security in the Face of a Changing Climate. And the report um, not noted that given threats identified by the defense, national security, and intelligence community arise in destructive climate impacts, but most importantly, our increased technological capacity to foresee these climate risks, that it has become what we call a responsibility to prepare to address challenges of climate security, both at home and abroad. So in a, um, what's called an ARIA meeting, to brief the National UN Security Council, um, Caitlin Wuerl of the CCS widened the concept to the international community of a responsibility to prepare agenda that should be developed by all nations while adhering to the overall um, framework of climate proofing security institutions at the international, regional, and national levels. So where we've come from establishing climate security concepts from threat multiplier to the responsibility to prepare and now to building this community of practice, which is really socializing these concepts internationally of the, the need to and responsibility to prepare. So on the policy level in the present, we see these concepts of climate security continuing to expand this year. So we've seen more of a mainstreaming of human and ecological security into security dialogues. Um, the Munich Security Conference concluded in February brought an expanded scope of climate security onto the agendas, establishing food security and the food security task force for the first time. Also topics such as conflict prevention from development assistance, peaceful climate change adaptation, and environmental peace building are understudied and unrepresented in climate security, but have now emerged onto the mainstream agenda. So recognizing these links as well of climate adaptation and stability and peace um, have also increased in, in Dubai, including the first Conference of the Parties Declaration on Peace and Security Issues, um, to which groups, including governments and think tanks, were able to sign upon um, at that time. So the role of climate finance and peace building has also emerged onto the agenda where 80 countries in Dubai signed a declaration on climate finance um, that should focus on countries that are already fragile and already um, unstable. So the rest of 2024 is a critical year in climate security for the climate agenda broadly, and then obviously for geopolitics. So we're coming off the hottest year um, on record. We've nearly breached the Paris Agreement's 1.5 Celsius target, but we have Another sort of uncertainty that um, was also outlined by Sharon, which is we have elections looming um, that could bring more hostile or more crucial, crucial climate actions to bear. So we'll either, either have more renewed political capital to build upon, um, to build upon climate security progress, or more likely we'll have a mix of political dynamics that are always emerging in unexpected ways. Um, one of these unexpected ways, of course, is the tempo of extreme weather events, climate-related disasters, um, and they're accelerating. But one thing I've really noticed in the last 10 years or so is that now climate impacts are, are leaving no part of America, no part, no um, congressional district um, unaffected or untouched. And so this has really changed the, the dialogue, at least in Washington. So the intensification of climate disruption is also coinciding with this fraught time for global security, including the Russian war in Ukraine, widening conflict in the Middle East, 
and then which has the potential to draw our attention away from the climate security agenda. Um, but political turbulence um, is not only in the U.S. This year we'll see elections in 60 countries representing 50% of the global population. So navigating these, um, th these turbulent waters requires an expansion of the national security and foreign policy workforce, both here um, abroad and in all allied na nations, and um, to develop climate literacy to be better prepared to communicate especially more complex challenges in the public discourse. So the future innovative innovation for higher education for both professionals and students in the academy is now for focused, has been focused on strengthening the epistemic community, but now facilitating the type of scholarship that's needed to move beyond the limited conceptual framework. So um, at the Center for Climate and Security, we have an intensified effort to build upon capacity through strategic education and foresight exercises. In the past six months, we've brought 170 individuals together from uniform military services, defense and, and foreign affairs, as well as um, most importantly, I think, students. So with the advent of the Anthropocene, there's a priority to promote climate security education um, as a workforce, both inside and outside the US government. So this includes ongoing efforts um, to integrate climate security into professional military education. Um, and then this is what really can provide a continuity and understanding and building this community of practice um, during fragi fragile and, and um, turbulent elections. So, you know, to, to, to wrap up, I would say um, in academia, studying climate risk has moved further and further beyond social sciences, traditionally associated with security studies, and has animated um, us to develop at Georgetown a program where we're rec integrating STEM training on environmental science with the other policy skills of traditional security studies. So we're um, welcoming our first cohort in the spring. And I was reading some application essays. Um, and what one of the, the applicants said is, while governments have become increasingly aware of how environmental threats and foreign policy priorities intersect, there's been limited opportunities in academia to explore this intersection. So I was thinking back on the um, opening remarks, mentioning the radical possibilities that we face right now. So reflecting on climate security in the past and fretting about the future, let us not forget the opportunities of the present, that we share the responsibilities to prepare for and prevent the worst impacts of climate change. But we also have the privilege to be engaged on the existential issue of our time, and we have the unique opportunity to equip future generations and future students with better knowledge and skills to address climate security to pursue a wiser path than we've taken so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to share my views as a defense scientist and what I've seen, the evolution of climate security within government research. And I'm going to start with where we are now and with a new, uh, that this is the new norm under which defense will be operating. And the recognition of that, I feel, has gained real traction in the last few years. And now there is a critical mass and we look at the amount of strategy coming out of uh, governments on climate security has increased in three years alone. The strong declarations from NATO and also that 12 nations are prepared to invest time, effort, resources and energy into the new NATO Climate Change and Security Centre of Excellence, I think demonstrates that acceptance that the new norm of climate change now and the necessity of preparing for the future. But within that understanding, there is still a huge degree of infancy of the research. So we know much more now about the drivers of uh, change, but the actual complex systems in which that's going to operate is where we have a real lack of uncertainty and require more understanding. Where I think uh, government research has made real bounds is by getting much more articulate about the demand and the necessity. And it's a very interesting journey that climate uh, science, climate security has been on within government. 
because it has been from a fringe issue, uh, mainstreamed and more recently spotlighted. Being able to articulate that climate and the security situation will worsen and put that into a military context has been a real effort over the last few years and aligning it with the central strategy approaches of how this will affect operational efficiency and readiness and freedom of access and manoeuvre and being able to talk about it in a multidisciplinary way has enabled a fringe topic to become much more forefront and we've seen those working in previous climate assurance roles kind of being dusted off and brought out of the broom cupboards and put into central strategy roles across defence. It's a growing momentum of where we are now. I think trying to translate some of those imperatives to those who need to act is going to drive us forward. But as we go back, I would like to say that in doing that recent spotlight, I hear lots of people across the defence and government circles talk about this new climate security initiative. But it is not new. And my fellow panellists as well have referenced some particularly important works spanning decades and we can put our hands very readily on very articulate research that has been scientists being salespeople asking for more prominence of this topic and demonstrating why it needs to be on more research agendas. Throughout that dedication, they haven't had conferences to share their findings in the way that reach practitioners. And I think that's where we also want to see the direction going, is being able to bridge that gap between the academic investigation and the practitioner's uh, adoption into strategy and plans and operations. So increasingly being able to translate what we see from the research into logistics and supply chain management and manoeuvrability and platform acquisition, which requires us to look decades ahead using research that was written decades ago. So bridging the gap, making it relevant is something we need to do. What I've seen in that research looking back is that we've had huge improvements in our ability to capture and analyse data. We've seen a, a huge increase in the sophistication of the analytical methods that we can use to understand the problems. We're also able to now extrapolate some really interesting patterns from a synthesis of a great deal of literature. Unfortunately, we're also able to access a range of innovations that have come from the civil sector, who, unlike the government in studying it for years, have been able to maintain innovations through their civil works programmes in key areas such as water security and food security, waste management, circular economy principles. So looking back, what I would really stress from a, a government uh, is that we start a very firm foundation of decades of research. This new spotlight, the 3,000, uh, that huge meteoric rise in publications leads people to think it is new, but it very much isn't. What we need to be able to do now within um, CASCO and within our nations is, is find the right change makers in our organisations to access that information so that they can now act. It is important to look back as we look forward and being able to extrapolate from past research into future scenarios is really challenging and we heard earlier that the other new is that we're in new and novel times. What we're going to need to be able to do throughout the research is sustain it and everything we're interested in requires funding. And the funding that comes from governments and the investment that we see into these topics needs to be prioritised because that funding also filters to academics and creates that demand signal for where the, the global research base needs to go. Defence is the cornerstone of stability and security and so we are going to need to be able to equip defence with the evidence and the foresight needed for them to operate in the future with agility. We need to support them to be able to defend and deter and respond against an increasingly complex set of challenges. And doing that requires us to have a much more nuanced understanding of the context in which all of these factors and all of these disciplines interact. We can also access a range of really eloquent statements on the importance of addressing climate security now and in the future. But what we really need is empirical 
localised specific investigations on which we can base clear assumptions and be able to put some parameters of confidence in. And that's a real challenge when we've seen, even in a, a simplistic model, the complexity of this area. One way in which we can do that is through as a community of research academics and practitioners, is bring some consistency into the terminology we use, the taxonomies that we use, and the comparability of our findings, so that we can gradually build up our knowledge base over time. The other area where we'd like to see uh, improvements and investments is in the data sharing. The the, if you look at the measures that are being developed and the more sophisticated models that are being used to describe climate security, when you start looking under the hood, there is a lot of proxies being used. So let's share what assumptions we are making when we develop our data-driven models because they look very good and uh, as a government uh, practitioner you're often demonstrated uh, presented with a range of demonstrations about really quite impressive looking models that uh, can predict the future but actually when you look at the statistical analysis beneath it the proxies that are being used to infer some of these very complex phenomena are still in their infancy and I think you'll hear from Bruno and Alex over the course of the conference about decision making under deep uncertainty and more nuanced, sophisticated methods that need to be developed in order to be able to um, predict and uh, act upon some of those findings. So if we can integrate that data driven multi hazard risk assessment uh, procedure that's going to require us as I said to talk a common language across disciplines and across applications and for defense to be very open about the range of different military tasks in which we want to understand the effects so this is everything from the left of arc influence stabilization efforts of which defense has developed a huge amount of capability and experience in theaters of operation but we need to understand its impact on war fighting and ability to protect the nations. But we also need to understand how this affects our military aid to civil authorities and our humanitarian and disaster response, both of which aren't force driving. So those are not factors which currently make sure that we procure and secure the, the capabilities that we need in the future. So what I would say from my view is that Looking at where we are now, it's the new norm. Looking at where we've been, it's not new. And looking at where we're going, it's very new and very novel. And it's going to require a sustained and iterative effort in which to address. I also see lots of people think there is this solution out there that once cracked, we will understand. And we're going to understand what we need to do to fix this climate security problem. But the system is huge and complicated and forever moving. And so this is going to require sustained effort, sustained dialogue and sustained collaborations. And I'm really pleased to be within CASCO in the research and analysis area where we can hopefully provide more forums like this and more opportunities to increase that dialogue between practitioners and the academics developing the solutions. So that as we publish more, the 3,000 rising to 6,000 papers, <laughs> that they are not doing 6,000 of the same thing and that we're <laughs> able to do some real depth analysis in some areas whilst maintaining the diversity of the research that we need to be able to address the challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great final words, yes. Thank you very much again, everyone. That was really fantastic first panel.